ask Taylor. I'm going to ask Taylor to call the roll. All right. Remembering, reminding everyone that you need to say where you're participating from, where you're physically located. All right, come to order. Um, Juliet Ballard. Juliet Ballard, Dexter, Michigan. Marta Larson. Um, Marta Larson is present. I'm participating from Northfield Township, Michigan. Murray Gress. Present, calling from Milan, Michigan. Margaret Reynolds. Present, I am calling in from Pittsfield Township. Elizabeth Thompson. Present, calling in from Ypsilanti Township. Jennifer Green. Present, calling in from the city of Ypsilanti. Phyllis Herzig. Present, calling from Ann Arbor. Jennifer Heckendorn. Present, calling from Palm Coast, Florida today. Ooh, ooh, nice. <laughs> <laughs> Jasmine Cooper. Present, calling from Ann Arbor, Michigan. Brenda McKinney. Present, calling in from Superior Charter Township. Commissioner Somerville. Present, calling in from the city of Ann Arbor. We have quorum. Thank you. At this time on the agenda, um, we have uh, public participation. You know, I think we're supposed to approve the agenda. I think we might have left that off. Um, so um, now, I'm, now I'm, I'm temporarily confused because I want to make sure I'm doing this right. So, well, nope, I guess we don't. Okay, never mind. All right. So it's now time for call to the public. Um, any member of the public that wishes to uh, make a comment to the uh, commission, uh, please raise your hand and we will call on you one at a time and I'll allow you to speak. I see that Yvonne Cudney has her hand up, followed by Rebecca. I'm sorry if I murder your last name, yeah, kick. Um, so we'll call on Yvonne Cudley first. Taylor, can you? Okay, thank you. Okay, got it. Um, so I just, I have to do this as an individual member of the public not in my professional role. I just wanna thank you all for the push to get the ARPA funding approved on um, behalf of the Ypsilanti Senior Center. Thank you. Okay, you can return her to the audience and uh, elevate Rebecca. Um, and yeah, Rebecca, would you please tell me how to pronounce your last name correctly? Yes, it's Yachik. Oh, I was close. Yeah, sure. yes, yes, but thank you for trying. Um, I am here um, on behalf of Phoenix Mobility Rising. I want to thank you all for your advocacy for um, pushing the uh, approval for the ARPA dollars. Um, with this funding, we'll be able to support 500 individuals with transportation. Um, and we will be hosting feedback sessions for older adults and their caregivers across uh, the county over the next year. So while there is a focus on the 48197, 48198 zip codes for those sessions, if a commission commissioner is interested in having a in-person feedback session for the transportation program that we're bringing, I would love to work with you all. But again, thank you so much for your advocacy and support. I really appreciate it. Okay, excellent. And if you would make sure that we have um, information about uh, the feedback sessions so that we can publicize those for you. Absolutely. Okay, Taylor, you can put Yvonne and Rebecca back in the audience. Um, and um, any member of the Co Commission on Aging that wishes to speak to any of the public comments that were made. I would. Uh, let me Go ahead, Brenda. Oh, uh, Rebecca, do you um have a contact number uh, to contact you if I have any questions about something? Absolutely. Okay. 
Um, my number, and I I can pass it along to Marie, who can send it out as well. It's 734-773-0907. And you can call me, you can text me. <laughs> um, okay. I'm available either way. Thank you. Of course. In, any other member of the commission have anything to say to the members of the public that have spoken? Seeing no hands raised, we're going to move ahead. Um, next item on the agenda is approval of the minutes uh, from the September 7th meeting. Do I have a motion? So move. So move. So moved by Brenda, supported by Marie. Mm -hmm. Is there any discussion? Okay, Taylor, will you call the roll then? Leah Ballard. You're muted, Juliet. Why don't you come back to her, Taylor? Marta Larson? Yes. Marie Gress? Yes. Margaret Reynolds? You're muted, Marky. Yes. Elizabeth Thompson? Yes. Jennifer Green? Yes. Phyllis Herzig? Yes. Jennifer Heckendorn? Yes. Jasmine Cooper? Yes. Brenda McKinney? Yes. Annie Somerville? Yes. Juliet Ballard? Yes. All right. Minutes approved and passed. Thank you. Um, I see you have uh, Rebecca still on as a panelist. Would you fix that? We'll leave um, Yvonne because she's the next speaker anyway. Um, okay, so the next item on the agenda is uh, presentations. And the first presentation we have today is the Housing Bureau of Seniors, Housing Bureau for Seniors. Yvonne Cudney is the speaker. Um, we're going to do this. Um, Yvonne, do you want people to wait until the end of your presentation to ask questions, or do you want questions addressed in the you know as you go along? Um, do you have her? Is she Can you hear me? No. no, no. no. Okay. Yeah. Um, at the end would be great. Okay. So we're gonna. I'm gonna turn the um, the um, floor floor over to you, and uh, at the end of your presentation, uh, we'll ask people who wish to ask to participate in discussion or ask questions, etc., to raise their hand one by one, um, and I, I can call on them and let you and them interact at that point. So okay. go ahead, Ivan. So let me just be sure. Do you all see uh, the big the big slide like presenter mode? No. We don't see any screen from you yet. Are you on share screen, Yvonne? I oh, am. There, you go. there, there we go. go. So what do you see now? The, the presentation. presentation. OK, great. Now I need to just see my notes. <laughs> OK. Uh, first off, my name is Yvonne Cudney. I'm the Community Outreach and Education Coordinator for the Housing Bureau for Seniors. Thank you for allowing me to present to you today. The agenda for this presentation is as follows. Um, it's about the senior housing landscape in Washtenaw County. I'm gonna talk about the Housing Bureau for Seniors, who we are and how we fit into the community. I'm gonna talk about aging in place and community because that's what most older adults want. I'm gonna talk about measurements of hardship or economical hardship for older adults. I'm gonna do a quick overview of the housing market, both rentals and homeowners here in Washtenaw County. Talk about best practices for increasing housing stability um, and give you a summary and wrap it up. I forgot to say, I have the remnants of COVID. So I'm gonna have a little bit of a hoarse throat and might cough occasionally, I apologize. 
To start, the Housing Bureau for Seniors is a program of U of M Health Community Health Services. CHS's mission, or Community Health Services, is to lead Michigan medicine in improving access, equity, and health outcomes in the community and for those we serve. Essentially, CHS is, is the bridge that links U of M Health to the community it serves. Community Health Services has nine different programs, of which HBS and Ann Arbor Meals on Wheels are two. All of our programs, all nine of them, address one of the five initiatives listed on this screen. The initiative that aligns with the work that we at HBS do is protecting the health and quality of life for our seniors. HBS, HBS's mission is to recognize that stable housing is imperative to the physical and mental well being of older adults, and frankly, to everybody, but we focus on older adults. And to that end, HBS informs and empowers older adults and those who care about them by providing guidance and resources regarding sustainable housing in Washtenaw County and beyond. Our housing work is critical to health care outcomes as housing insecurities associated with a number of health problems, including anxiety, depression, heart attacks, insomnia, suicide, increased use of illicit drugs, and Ill increased use of illicit drugs. There are also studies um, that show that older adults who've experienced evictions or foreclosures have increased emergency department visits for up to two years following their eviction or foreclosure. Now moving on to services and how we help. We have a number of core programs that we offer those who are 55 and older, and all of our core programs are staffed by MSWs who work to try to holistically help our clients. Our focus is always on sustainability. We offer workshops to educate and increase empathy for the older adult population, and we can tailor our presentations based on recipient need and our expertise. We also hold two annual events, Senior Living Week and Big Hearts for Seniors, um, today is the final day of Senior Living Week. We're um, currently hosting a presentation uh, at the same time as this presentation about human trafficking. And then this afternoon, we have a final presentation about how to avoid probate from Bassett Murray. To provide further context for the Housing Bureau for Seniors, please consider the iceberg analogy. The tip of the iceberg is what we see. Most of what makes the iceberg, however, is well below the surface, often unseen and unheard. That tip of the iceberg is literal homelessness. We see it on city streets, corners, and tent cities, and we read about it in the papers. It's very noticeable to most, and there are many, though not enough, resources to address homelessness in our communities, such as homeless shelters and resources for rapid rehousing and permanent supportive housing. It's important to note that adults 65 and older are the fastest growing age group of people who are experiencing homelessness at this point. In Washtenaw County, approximately 19% of homeless households are older adults over the age of 55. At HBS, we focus on issues and concerns below the surface with the intention of preventing literal homelessness. These are the people who are living in unaffordable housing. The people we see are often in unaffordable housing, robbing Peter to pay Paul. These people are often one injury, one accident, one negative major life event away from crisis. Affordable house, unaffordable housing can lead to unstable housing. This is where the threat of losing one's home is imminent. Signs of unstable housing include consistently falling behind on rent or mortgage mortgages and the inability to pay for food, medications, and utilities. Unstable housing and unaffordable housing um, both have uh, both can lead to hidden homelessness, which has a variety of names, um, including couch surfing, living um, couch to pillar. It's estimated that a that approximately two percent of Washtenaw County residents are experiencing hidden homelessness. The majority of older adults want to age in place. Aging in place refers to living independently, safely, and comfortably in one's home for as long as possible. The majority, 88% of older adults between the ages of 50 and 80, want to remain in their homes for as long as possible. Yet only 34% of older adults 
believe that their homes have the necessary features to age in place. In addition to needing requisite modifications or an accessible home, older adults often require social support in order to successfully age in place. Social supports include assistance with household chores, grocery shopping, managing finances, transportation to and from doctor's appointments and social activities. Only one in five adults or 19% between the ages of 50 and 80 said that they are confident that they could afford to pay for these social supports. Now looking at um, aging in place or housing insecurity in Washtenaw County, Washtenaw County has approximately 370,000 residents of which 20% or 72,000 are 60 years or older. These 72,000 older adult residents comprise nearly 30,000 households. The house on the left in this graphic shows that about 82% of those 32 of those 30,000 households are homeowners and 18% are renter occupied. The house on the right illustrates housing cost burden. Those are the households that spend more than 30% of their income on housing expenses, meaning either mortgages and rent or rent and utilities. 53% of renters are housing cost burdened and about 26.5% of homeowners are. In numbers, this means that nearly 10,000 households or 31% of older adult households are having a hard time making ends meet in this county. So when considering housing insecurity for older adults, we need to think about incomes, rates of poverty and economic hardship. This, this slide has um, a bunch of different information. If you look at the chart on the left, it shows the federal poverty limit for 2023. It's $14,580. The federal poverty level provides a national standard for determining poverty. It results, however, in an undercount of households living with economic hardships. Therefore, United for Alice, another measure, and HUD have determined or created other um, measures for determining economic hardship. This slide will discuss the federal poverty levels in Alice, and the next slide will talk about HUD's AMI, or Area Median Income, as its basis for determining who is eligible for, quote, affordable housing. So looking at the chart on the left on this slide, you see the difference in the national federal poverty level standard and the Alice survival budget for a single person household in Washtenaw County. Um, it's 14,500 versus nearly 34,000. Looking at the chart in the middle, you see the monthly expenses that comprise the household survival budget. The Alice household survival budget is the bare minimum cost of a household of household basics necessary to live and work in this Washtenaw County economy. The basic budget items include housing, childcare, food, transportation, healthcare, and technology. Miscellaneous is a little 10% cushion if a household has any problems because they invariably do. Um, and then the annual total is about $34,000. Uh, Alice calculates the cost of household essentials for each county in Michigan and in the United States. And it's based on the American Community Survey. Finally, on the chart to the right, you see that 6% of older adult households in Washington County live under the federal poverty level and an additional 39% have incomes below the Alice household survival budget. And that's pretty much in line with the previous slide that said about one third or 10,000 um, households or 20,000 people uh, or 30,000 people, excuse me, are having a hard time making ends meet in Washtenaw County. Now, turning to HUD's definitions of economic or income hardship. HUD works, oops, sorry. Yeah, HUD works with the concept of area median incomes. It is a measure that is used to determine eligibility for quote, affordable housing. The slide is chock full of information. So I'm gonna try and work my way through it. In the left chart, you see that varying levels of area median incomes for 2023 uh, and their accompanying or associated income levels. So 30% AMI is equivalent to $24,750. 50% is 41,420, 
60 is $49,500 and 80% AMI is $62,600. To the right of those income levels, you see the maximum rents that can be, that developers or managers of building developments can charge for quote, affordable units. They have these income levels associated that have the income levels associated with them. For so, so for someone who moves into um, an apartment that is targeted at extremely low incomes, $24,750 a year, the maximum rent they can pay is $619. What's important to note here is that the federal poverty limit or $14,580 amounts to $1,215. Someone living in poverty, $1,215 a month, does not have sufficient income to afford a unit that is targeted at 60% of the area median income. And you can see over in the chart to the right, these are all of the affordable housing complexes for seniors in Washtenaw County. And most of them target incomes that are anywhere between 50 and 60% of the area median income. So someone living in poverty is never going to be able to afford a unit that targets someone who's at 50%, 41,420, or 60% um, AMI. At best, they can afford the extremely low income levels where they would spend approximately one half their income on rent. Hold on, moving my mouse. Someone who has $35,000 a year in income, that's the Alice level, theoretically only qualifies for a 50% or a 30% AMI unit right here, these two. And it's important to note though, that if they apply for a 50% area median income unit, so the Alice levels are about 40% of the area median income, and they have to have income below the 50% AMI to move into that type of unit, which they do. Um, if they move into a 50% AMI unit, they will be paying approximately 35% of their income for rent. Now, looking at the chart on the right, I've listed all the affordable and subsidized units in Washtenaw County, older adult housing units in Washtenaw County. Of note here is there are, that there are about um, 1,850 subsidized and affordable, quote, affordable units. So these are, it's the two purple circles here. And I didn't realize until um, after I did this that there are about 60 more vouchers. So 1,275 of these units have vouchers associated with them. And what that means are those households pay approximately one third of their income towards rent. So even though the entire development targets um, 50 and 60 or 80% of the area median income, there are often project-based vouchers associated with them so that people truly are or truly are living in affordable units. There are an additional 581 units in Washtenaw County that are below market rate or are quote affordable. So uh, that's a great thing. Um, what's also a great thing is if you look at this red rectangle right here, there are two new developments coming online that are currently in build. Um, the Clark Road Senior Project has 152 units that are gonna target people or households with incomes between 40 and 60%. In Lockwood of Ann Arbor, which is being built on um, Ellsworth, and looks like it's nearing completion, I drive by there quite often, we'll have 65 out of 154 units that target households that have incomes below 60% AMI. Um, so again, those are households with nearly $50,000, which is really not very affordable, not affordable at all for someone living in poverty or 35% um, of our population, so forty-five percent of the older adult population who have incomes below um, thirty-five thousand dollars, that Alice threshold. So, finally, the biggest takeaways here are that affordable housing will never be affordable for a person living in poverty unless they have a rental subsidy. And um, I just want to note this statistic, this trend nationally. 
In 2020, only 39% of older adults who qualified for rental assistance through federal subsidies based on low income received it. So there's very much a shortage of um, affordable units for older adults, both in Washington County and nationally. This slide uh, is just a map that shows where all the senior subsidized and affordable complexes are located in Washtenaw County. Most of the apartments are located in urban areas, which is great for older adults who live in urban areas, but there are large rural geographic areas that don't have affordable units, making it difficult for older adults from rural communities to downsize and remain in their own communities, which is where 88% of the population wants to remain. While we're talking about rental units and affordable units, it's critical to look at eviction rates in Washtenaw County, as eviction rates are a bright line or a clear indicator of housing instability. Eviction rates varied widely within the county in 2018, but Washtenaw County's filing rate averaged 11.3%, meaning that there, were about, there was about one eviction case filed for every nine rental housing units in the county, placing Washtenaw County 25th among Michigan's 83 counties for evictions. Again, though, the number is most likely an underestimate of the number of renters experiencing housing instability. Many renters move to less expensive units out of the county or in with friends and family when they receive notice that the rent is going to increase, and in that way, they avoid an eviction entirely. Um, <clears throat> the pie chart on the right just shows what district courts the evictions were filed, and there are only three district courts in Washtenaw County um, that take evictions. So that's just a quick uh, chart of that. This Turning to national trends of homeowner insecurity now, it used to be a goal to pay off mortgages prior to retiring. That has changed significantly since 1989. If you look at this chart, you see the share of homeowners age 65 and over with housing debt doubled from 1989 to 2019. So this blue, um, bar shows that about 22 or 21 percent of older adults in 1989 still carried mortgages with them into retirement and the average mortgage at that point was eighteen thousand dollars 30 years later that number has doubled it's now 42 percent of older adults are carrying mortgages into their retirement and in 2019 dollars the average uh, mortgage that they're taking with them is eighty six thousand dollars The slide illustrates the number of mortgage foreclosures over the course of one year following the lifting of the COVID foreclosure moratorium. There were a total of 182 mortgage foreclosures. 68% of them were centered around Ipsy and Ann Arbor. 9% of the foreclosures were in the Whitmore Lake area. Um, and of importance is that 44% of the foreclosures in Washtenaw County following the COVID moratorium involved older adult households. So now moving on to tools to help older adults stabilize housing. Let me begin with this caveat. These promising avenues or best practices are based on my research. I'm not advocating for any particular one. Some of them are um, particular to Washtenaw County and some are just research that I found looking around. So the most obvious way forward for increasing affordable housing for older adults is to build it. The county can facilitate the building of affordable housing by committing public land and or funding. There's local precedents for both of these avenues. The county committed Platte Road for the Viridian Complex to Avalon for the Grove at Viridian. It will provide 50 affordable housing units to people impacted by homelessness. The county was also um, asked by then Board of Commissioner uh, Jason Morgan to investigate county-owned property at 175 North Main Street in Ann Arbor um, so that it could be used to impact affordable housing. That was in May, on May 5th, 2022, or like that's when it was reported last year. Um, an affordable housing millage is an option. The city of Ann Arbor passed an affordable housing millage in 2021 that was 1.0 mills and is in effect until 2041. It also provides for supportive services it's allowed the Ann Arbor Housing Commission to begin developing new affordable housing in and around Ann Arbor. Currently, the Ann Arbor Housing Commission in Avalon 
are jointly developing 68 affordable units at 121 Catherine for artists and people exiting homelessness. And the Ann Arbor Housing Commission has its eyes on six more Ann Arbor city lots, including the old Y. Because building is so expensive, funders and others are often interested in other tools to help older adults, e.g. zoning, zoning and policy changes. That's what the second bullet addresses. Dexter, Chelsea, and Ann Arbor are all looking at changes to zoning regulations to accommodate the building of accessory dwelling units. Chelsea is also considering developing smaller subdivision requirements for cottages. So those don't really uh, require any financial investment or land investment in our options for the county. Other promising avenues include exp expanding funding opportunities or actually providing services that directly provide aging in place modifications. I'm gonna list some attempts to do this. Some of these programs have wait lists and some of the programs no longer exist because they were pilots and based on grant funding. OCED provides ramps um, for people who are permanently disabled. There's a wait list for that. Habitat for Humanity can occasionally do walk-in showers. YMAO has a capable program that they got funded through um, that they got funded through grant funding. Um, again, that only targets people in Ypsilanti. Ann Arbor had an aging in place efficiently program in 2021. All these programs provided limited services that by no means can serve all the seniors who need them. And some of them are no longer in existence. The county can also look at increasing funding for resources or services to encourage aging in place. Medicare provides limited coverage for home health care services, such as skilled nursing or physical therapy. It does not cover homemaker services, such as grocery shopping or cleaning, or personal care services, such as assistance with bathing. As a reminder, only 19% of older adults feel confident that they'll be able to afford those homemaker and personal care services on their own. I'd also like to point out at this point that um, the Washna Health Initiative and the Healthy Aging Collaborative had um, a summit last year. Last year, they spent the entire year looking at transportation for older adults in Washna County. Uh, so low cost transportation is definitely an issue for older adults. Um, and Catholic Social Services has a lawn care and snow removal service, but as far as I know, they're the only ones in the county who do that. And um, they can only provide those services, services a limited number of times for each household. By, it by no means meets the need in this county. Finally, um, Washtenaw County um, can look at increasing the poverty exemption guidelines for those rural areas that still use the federal poverty limit as threshold incomes. And Michigan municipalities must allow low income homeowners to apply for partial or complete waivers of their property taxes. The higher the income levels, the more owner occupied homeowners can apply. The city of Ypsilanti did this last year, increasing their um, income levels from the poverty level. Uh, they nearly doubled it to $25,000, which would allow 100 more households in the city of Ipsy to apply for a waiver of their property taxes. And then finally, shared housing. This enables two or more unrelated people to share housing for their mutual benefit. A person offers a private bedroom and a shared common area in exchange for rent and help around the house or a combination of the two. Um, the Housing Bureau for Seniors used to host this program for Washington County, but due to uh, COVID, the program shut down. We've been looking for someone else to take it over. Um, or to develop a new program. So it would be great if the county could help out in that way. So on summary, older adults want to age in place and community, but need assistance to safely do so. 31% or 10,000 older adult households in Washington County are struggling to make ends meet. Building affordable housing is expensive, but with municipal intervention, it is possible and accessibility modifications and increased service resources will allow many more older adults to age in place and community. And uh, now I can entertain questions and then there's my contact information. Can you keep that up for a moment, please? Your contact sure. information. This information will also be included in the minutes of today's meeting.
your contact information, I should say. While everyone is uh, taking down those notes, I just want to note that there is someone in the audience with their hand raised, and we've already passed the time for public participation, so um, that question or comment will not be able to be addressed in the agenda that we have. Um, now, hopefully, this person can come back to the next meeting, and, and we'll call on them during the call to the public. <clears throat> so, um, I have a are, has everyone got what they need? Can we take the slide down so we can see each other? I want to get the address. One second. Brenda, I just took a screenshot of it so I can email you the screenshot. Okay, I got it. I'm all set now. Okay, so we can yeah stop sharing. And uh, if you want to speak with... Um, Yvonne, about her presentation, ask questions, make comments, uh, raise your hand. And I see that Brenda has her hand up. So we'll start with you, Brenda. Yvonne, I think your presentation was incredible. It was wonderful. Thank you very much. Um, I would like to stop by your office and pick up a copy of this. I, my printer doesn't work. So I would love to have a copy of that. Is that possible? Sure. Um just check with me. I've been out of the office because of COVID. <laughs> okay. To make sure that I'm Brenda. back in the office. I should be back in next week. Okay. Thank you. Brenda, I can get this printed and I can drop it off to your house. Oh, well, oh thank you very much. I would appreciate that. Thank you. Yep. No problem. Is that everything you had, Brenda? Or? Yes. Yes. Okay. Anybody else? Um, is she, uh, Yvonne, are you going to share your presentation with us? Is that, did I hear that? I, th I sent it off this morning or yesterday to, um, to a few people here so they could disseminate it to all of you. Okay. I believe Taylor is going to disseminate it. Are you not? Yeah. yeah it, it'll go out with the uh, notes today. Mm -hmm. And it will also be on the, um, Commission on Aging website, I believe. So it will be accessible to the public. Um, Elizabeth. Yeah, thank you so much, Yvonne. And thank you too for um, going over some of the ideas that are in addition to new construction. Um, because sometimes people forget that those other programs can really help people stay in place. And I know you went over them uh, without giving any recommendations about which things were the best to pursue. But I'm wondering if you might feel comfortable sharing what the Housing Bureau for Seniors experience has been with the different kinds of programs. Did you find them to be the ones that we have had in Washtenaw County? Um, did they seem to be effective? Um, what was your uh, client base's response to them? I guess I'm trying to get a bit of a sense of out of this world of choices, what are some ones that I might be able to, to focus on finding out more about? <laughs> okay, so great question. The need is so great mm -hmm. for all of them, right? Mm -hmm. For modifications, for services, like people don't want to plan for those emergency circumstances as we age. And it invariably happens to all of us, mm -hmm. right? But we don't want to plan for it. And, mm -hmm. and some of us just really financially can't plan for it. Mm -hmm. Um, so I, I personally, I mean, I would listen to the service providers out there who say there's this need. I worked for the Office of Community and Economic Development for a while doing their weatherization intakes and home rehab intakes, right? I constantly heard about older from older adults who needed plumbing repairs, who needed mm -hmm. electrical updates. There are no programs in Washington County that provide that, mm -hmm. right? Mm -hmm. um, there is a ramp program. There's a they open the wait list for a very short amount of time and then they close it because it fills up so quickly. The same is true of the roof program at OCED. 
right? Mm -hmm. They open it up for a brief period of time. They can take about 20 roofs a year and then they close it. Uh, Catholic Social Services talks about um, they can only serve a household like twice a winter for snoveling, shoveling snow. This is based on my memory, okay? I didn't ask them mm -hmm. this information and I don't always have the best memory. But um, and but they also provide that lawn limited. mowing service. So, but it's not enough, right? And I don't even know, I, I very rarely have contact with programs um, that actually provide in-home supportive services like grocery shopping, mm -hmm. um, help help with the ADUs. Yeah. No, not the ADUs. I'm getting them all confused now. What is it? The ADLs, ADLs, ADLs activities of daily living, right? Like I, I, I'm sure there's not enough services there either. Mm -hmm. Um, so I would just say that the need is really great. And that, um, I mean, it's no secret that there are a number of older adult service providers that have been advocating for the senior millage. They're the people who have the boot, they're the boots on the ground who really know what this community needs. So um, I think I think I would talk with them some more too, but the need is just incredible. Are you all set? Um, yes, thank you so much. Okay, I see Phyllis with her hand up. So Phyllis, you can go, go forth. Thanks, Yvonne. Great presentation. <clears throat> um, does the Housing Bureau for Seniors still have a program about hoarding? Um, there was a hoarding task force. In there, and the Central. hoarding task force is still in existence. I don't remember where it's located and who is doing it. I have to check with my coworkers on that. Okay. And the other question I had was on your slide about evictions, Salem Township had many more evictions. I'm not sure where Salem Township is. And I wondered why, why it has so many. That's a really good question. Uh, I had that piece of information in my notes, just in case someone asked. Salem Township has a very <laughs> low percentage of rentals, and they also have a mobile home park. So on that mm. slide that showed oh. all the evictions, here's most of the, so Salem Township, for that reason, had a very high percentage uh, compared to the number of rentals in that particular area. Mm. The thing about the evictions <clears throat> here in Washtenaw County are most, uh, the highest rates are centered in and around Ipsy, of course. And also in Augusta Township and Sio Township, where there are large mobile home parks. Thank you. Would you say that that also applies then to the Whitmore Lake area because of the large mobile home park there? So interesting, right? Like I was surprised that that wasn't higher there. What I did see surprising was was a high rate of foreclosures in Whitmore Lake. Um especially since, I mean, I think it's it's high because there are fewer homes out there than for say, for instance, Ipsy or Ann Arbor, um, which is concerning to me. Mm -hmm. Yeah. Okay, anybody else have any questions or thoughts they wanna share at this point before we move ahead? Okay, well, I thank you all again for allowing me to present to you. I have one question, um, if I can, Marta, please. Okay. Um, Yvonne, we're gonna have another town hall next June. Um, would it be possible for you to participate with a uh, commission on aging? With sure. some information? Okay, sure. thank you. I would love that. Okay. Brenda has got her net out for that town hall. <laughs> Don't get too close to her. She's, she's going to sign you up. You're signed up, Yvonne. I will be contacting you with a date in, for next June. Okay, great. Thank you so much. I appreciate it. Okay. And again, thank you for allowing me to present to you all. Yeah, thanks for being here. Appreciate it. Get well. Okay. Thanks.
The next item on the agenda is the AAA 1B Ombudsman presentation. Um, and I do not see either of those presenters in the audience. Um, Taylor, do you know anything about that situation? Is it Mary? And I've got Stephanie here as well. Mary and Louise. Mm -hmm. Oh, you've already. Oh, so Mary is a person that in the audience mm -hmm. that had her hand raised. Is that is that the same person? Okay. Yeah. Okay. Um, all right. So do you have Mary and Louise on board or yep, they, they are now on? already promoted. <laughs> <laughs> If okay, uh, we're going to follow the same process here. Uh, do you prefer to have questions as we go along, or do you want them at the end of your presentation? At the end, please. Yeah. Okay, so I'm going to turn the floor over to you two, and I'll let you do your presentation. And then um, afterwards, I'll take the floor back and call on people you know, one by one to you know address questions and make comments. So Thank you. All right. Thank you. And then Stephanie was going to pull up our... PowerPoint? Yeah, I'll share my screen. Great, thank you. Yeah. There we go. Can everyone see that? Yeah. I guess okay. good enough, right? Um, yeah. Do you want me to try to move this? I guess we need it. Um, you can see morning. the full screen, not the one with the notes. Yeah, we're just seeing a okay. lot of picture camera people's pictures on the side. So hopefully that's okay. Um, that we can read it all. Um, good morning. We're from the Area Agency on Aging, 1B, the ombudsman, uh, two of three of us at the 1B agency. Um, my name is Mary Katsarellis, and I'm the ombudsman in Oakland County. And my name is Louise Verbecki, and I cover um, Washtenaw, Monroe, Livingston, and, and part of Oakland County that Mary doesn't cover. Okay, so the long-term care ombudsman. In 1972, a demonstra demonstration program under President Nixon's seven-point initiative. So I, part of my screen is being covered, so I can't see it. Can we get out of there? You should be able to minimize the, because um, oh, you can see the attendees. Just pull it over. To make it smaller. Okay, hang on one second. Okay, okay, perfect. Thank you. It's an eight point initiative to improve nursing home care. Today, um, the ombudsman program e exists in all states, the District of Columbia, Puerto Rico, Guam, under the authorization of the Older Americans Act. Each state has an office <clears throat> of the state long term care ombudsman headed by a full time state ombudsman. So Sally Pung is our state ombudsman. And then we have an assistant state ombudsman, Carrie Craig. Um, and then we have legal counsel and her name is Marae Phillips. Okay, next. Um, Michigan, uh, what the ombudsman work does, we have, or how many we have, approximately 20 local ombudsmen across the state. Um, we have pre-pandemic about 30 to volunteer or student interns. Um, currently at 1B, we don't have any interns. After the pandemic, a lot of people kind of uh, fell away, but we're hopefully building that number back up. We work in 460 nursing homes, mm -hmm. serving approximately 47,583 residents. Um, our home for the aging adult foster care homes that we serve, uh, 4,472 4, home for the aged, and approximately 52,886 residents in adult foster care homes, which is your group homes. Um, of our current staff at 1B, Elaine Hearns is in Macomb and St. Clair. And as I mentioned, I'm in Oakland and Louise has um, Livingston, Monroe, Oakland, and Washtenaw. Um, there are approximately 105 nursing homes in our service region. Um, we're getting another one in Troy and uh, it keeps growing. Next. So our goals, program goals, is to focus on residents' rights and quality of life and quality of care. And quality of life and care can include a lot of different things. Um, that could be the care that's received. It could be um, anything from food. It could be personal care. It could be 
um, back to the food texture, quality, um, quantity. Um, it includes a lot of different things. Um, we also support resident and self-advocacy. Um, we don't want to create dependence if a resident is able to advocate on their own, but certainly we're there to support and um, encourage and advocate when needed. We seek systemic change to improve resident outcomes. Those bigger things are care, staffing, not that we could really have a direct impact on the, on the staffing, but the staffing actually is a direct link to all of the problems such as uh, care, call out response time, all of those things. Um, our approach is to collaborate with, with and support facilities in reaching shared goals. So we try to present as a, as a team member, even though um, they may not see it that way, the facilities, but we really are a part of the team for the betterment of care for the resident. We work creatively to be a part of the solution. We serve as a resource in working with families or responsible parties. We are a neutral third party obligated to advocate for the resident's wishes. So that means that if a family member calls us and says that they have all these complaints for the resident and we go see the resident, if the resident says everything's fine, then we can't do anything. So the resident is our client. Okay, next. How is our work done? We visit licensed nursing homes at least quarterly and any time to investigate complaints. So we're in the facilities quite often. Um, the ones that we don't get a lot of complaints would just be basically our quarterly reviews. Um, our program is notified of complaint surveys and involuntary discharges by state survey agency generating cases. So um, we're, we're, we are uh, notified before the state goes in to do a yearly inspection, which is called a survey. And, um, and then we participate with them. Um, if we do a resident council with the state, we get involved with that and then involuntary discharges. And I think we've got a case about that moving forward um, to share. Um, we keep our work in a separate um, program called Well Sky and around the state, all of us ombudsmen log into that. Um, strict confidentiality must have resident consent, as I mentioned, and um, people trying to get a hold of us. Um, it's a geo routed uh, number, and our number is 866 485 9393. So it, the area code then bumps over to the ombudsman who's in charge of that area. At the end of our screen, we've got more information, email, that kind of thing, information. So for you to copy down next. Okay, um, our top complaints and issues include involuntary discharges and evictions from a facility, uh, failure to respond to requests for help, lack of dignity and respect and staff treatment of residents, medication mistakes, uh, and requests for less restrictive settings. Um, those are our main complaints for, for residents in nursing homes. Um, our duties, are we serve residents of nursing homes, homes for the aged and adult foster care home homes. We help individual residents and or families resolve complaints. Uh, we empower residents to communicate their concerns and assist and assist them in resolving them. And we advocate to improve the quality of care and life. Um, as ombudsmen, we advocate and encourage self-determination. We support residents and help them to uh, shape their own agenda and goals. We advocate for resident rights and assist them in exercising those rights. Uh, we provide information for long-term care options and provide information about government benefits and other uh, agencies' assistance. Um, we can help resolve payment issues to avoid involuntary discharges because um, involuntary discharge for non-payment is one of the uh, first and foremost reasons uh, for involuntary discharges. Okay, they can they can discharge you for non-payment, and usually there's not a whole lot of questions about that. Um, we help residents uh, revoke court appointed guardians, and we try to educate the staff on appropriate use of those guardianships. Mm -hmm. uh, we clarify 
authority of durable powers of attorney uh, for staff impacting practices to support residents' choice. Uh, and we connect residents to uh, legal support uh, for notices of involuntary discharges. Um, we advocate, provide information and assistance and conduct visits to, to uh, nursing facilities. That's how we uh, try to stay visible in the in and around the community. And we have to visit all the nursing homes quarterly. Okay, so we try to be um, visible so that um, the residents know who their ombudsman is. Uh, we are not vigilantes, special interest visitors, or friendly visitors. We are consultants to facilities. We provide community education and we promote, we promote uh, interagency coordination. We support resident and family councils. We are not professional speakers, professional meeting attendees, or presidents of councils in the nursing homes. Uh, this is our information for the Michigan Long-Term Care Ombudsman Program, our website. Uh, you can reach a local ombudsman at this 866 number, um, and you can reach the state long-term care ombudsman at the, the other number there. So, um, I think Taylor's probably going to give everybody a copy of this um, of this uh, PowerPoint presentation so that you have that information. Okay. So one of the one of the ways we've helped residents is is about a discharge. So discharges from nursing homes and um, and uh, nursing homes to return home when unsafe. So a lot of times. I'll let you read that, but a lot of times uh, facilities, when a resident is done with rehab, they'll, they'll say, okay, it's time for a discharge. And if they don't want the resident to stay for whatever reason, behavioral problems, things like that, they will try to discharge them um, back, to the, back to their home, which is basically unsafe. So in this particular case, um, a resident was going to be discharged on a Friday back home. And so the family had called me to say he she, he can't go home because there is nobody there. There's nobody there to take care of this person. And so fortunately they got a hold of us in time. So we stopped the discharge. We they were going to have some distant relative pick the resident up and take them home and then scramble. And so we were able to stop that discharge um, and then come the next week, we were able to um, find a different uh, facility that was closer to a family friend who they could pop in to see the resident while they were recuperating further before they could go home. So um, a lot of these things happen a lot. And so um, fortunately, I say that that this family was able to get a hold of us in the ninth hour to stop that. Oh, and another way we help people is uh, readmissions. Uh, residents with behavioral problems are often sent to, to hospitals for psych services. Um, and then the home will refuse to take them back due to citations from the state or are not wishing to deal with the challenging behaviors. Well, hospital dumping is, um, is a they can be cited by the state for, for leaving a person in the hospital when um, when they take in a person. So um, what happens usually is that um, we, the hospitals seem to have our numbers on speed dial, okay? So when, when somebody drops somebody off at a hospital, they will call us and say, we have a person here um, that was, brought in and the facility is refusing to take them back. Um, I had just this past week, I had a, a person um, who was left at the hospital for psych services and they had told the hospital that they would not call the person back. Hospital called me and I called the, the husband to get permission to advocate for his wife. 
Um, and then I called the home and I asked the home, why, why were they not taking the person back and found out that the person, the person was definitely uh, having some behavioral issues. Uh, she was being very combative and uh, there were actually problems. So, um, and when I had talked to the husband, the husband had told me that his wife was indeed out of control and she was having some issues and he had been trying to um, get the hospital to keep her for a while so that they could try to get her under control. Well, then after I talked to the, to the home and they said that they would indeed take her back if the hospital kept her and got her under control. I then turned around and called the case manager at the hospital and explained to her what the home had said, that they said that they would take her back, but they needed her to be under control when she came back. And so uh, the case manager said she would take it to her team and they would decide what to do. Eventually she called me back and said, well, they are gonna keep the resident for a while and see if they couldn't help her because she was actually being combative at the hospital. So once they got that resident, uh, once they get that resident under control, the resident will be able to go back to her home facility, which is um, which is the outcome we like to have. So um, that's a readmission uh, problem that we, we work on a lot of those. Okay. Next. And then legal assistance. So at time there are residents who are appointed a public guardian while incapacit while in an incapacitated state while in the hospital. And while there, they can't identify family or friends to provide medical decision making. So what happens is an emergency guardian gets appointed. And so moving forward, um, when that resident is back into their, you know, after maybe surgery or things like that, they've got this guardian and it's really difficult to get, to get rid of those guardians and those kind of appointments. They seem to, to hang on. So we can make referrals to our legal counsel or uh, we have access to um, legal services and, um, and they can represent the resident to determinate that guardianship. Um, it's a long process. But um, we've been able to successfully get, uh, I don't know how many, um, I would say I've had like maybe eight. Yeah. Yeah. So um, it is a longer process to do that, but it, it's just so great to see these residents free from a guardian, trying to make medical and financial decisions for them, and they can make their own independently again. Um, also, um we help to make sure that um, residents are able to have the visitors they want. Um, during, during the pandemic, of course, everybody know that there was uh, restrictions on uh, visitation. Um, and, and sometimes the guardians, um, you know, can, tr can try to place all kinds of reasons why families shouldn't visit the person or, or, or they wanna say who the person can visit. Um, and at times we have to intervene on behalf of the resident. Um, and, and now that, the, well, the pandemic is not over because COVID is still alive and well. As a matter of fact, I just had a call this morning before this meeting from a resident who called to say that there's COVID in the facility and should they be allowing visitors to come in? Well, right now, facilities are not allowed to restrict visitation no matter what, even if a person, even if there's COVID in the building is up to um, the person, family member and, and everybody to make their own decision as to where they, whether they want to um, go into the building or not. So, um, and, and guardianship and usually guardians, um, when we, we have to um, advocate to the guardians to have visitors because sometimes they will uh, restrict all family members and that's not right. I think I think anybody who has a guardian, if they have family, they should be able to, to visit their family. So um, so we advocate for those things um, all the time. And it's, and it's those family members that sometimes there's issues with the, 
like we said in the example, complaints or things like that. So then the facility doesn't want to deal with them, but the resident wants to see their family members. So again, that's advocacy that we provide to make sure that they're able to see the people that they want to see. Okay. Um. Um, common call types is care, uh, showers, personal care, oral care, call light response time. Um, typically residents get two showers a week and, uh, and more if they request it, but sometimes that's even a, a challenge. I was in a resident council meeting a couple days ago and the residents were all still complaining about not getting their showers. So, and they don't get it the next day if they miss the day before because of staffing. So, um. And then staffing, like we said, that is the common denominator for all of the issue, most of the issues of care and uh, that residents do or don't receive. Mm -hmm. uh, and, and, and staffing, staffing right now, staffing is kind of the overall problem um, in, in almost all nursing homes because they don't have enough staff. It makes all of these other issues, care, medication, uh, eras, dietary and even equipment, you know, equipment. Um, it makes all of these other issues um, magnified because they don't have enough staffing. And that relates even to the medications. Mm -hmm. um, I was in a building yesterday that three of the residents and one specifically said their Norco, their pain meds are not ordered in a timely manner. They run out. And so the one resident had told me that she hadn't gotten it for five days and she was going through a massive withdrawal. And so she asked, please get, make sure that you can get my prescriptions ordered timely so I don't go without because she never wants to go through what she had to go through to get that next dose. So um, we see it all the time, unfortunately. So yeah. I think that's it. Also, if that's questions? <laughs> Okay, so who has a question or a comment? I see Brenda with her hand up, so we'll get Brenda first and we'll get Jennifer next. Mary, you had mentioned um, COVID. Uh, well, I guess let me start over. How did you guys handle uh, the nursing homes when they were putting patients with COVID in the nursing homes? Remember when? Um, yes, yes. So what, what? Yeah. So what they did was, um, in in the beginning, um, they identified COVID hubs, different facilities that were able to accommodate residents. And actually, the ombudsman program had a say in some of those facilities that were going to be identified as that. Um, we, uh, depending upon the layout of the building, did they have a secure area that was separate from other residents? Did mm. It, did the care, did the staff, was the caregiving appropriate from what we, we knew it at that time? So, mm -hmm. um, so the residents did go to COVID units and then transferred back. And I think, um, was it effective? Mm -mm. No. Probably no. yes no. and no. There were yeah. benefits and no benefits. So, um, you know, they tried to keep the other residents safe. Um, but it was it was chaos in the chaos. beginning in yeah. the beginning of the breakout. Yeah, I know several people who died from yes. and they were yeah. put in those facilities. Mm -hmm. And uh, they were close friends of mine and sorry. they died. Yeah. We're sorry to hear that. Yes. But 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 you know, in the beginning no nobody knew how to deal with with the right. COVID. Yeah. So, oh, I understand. Yeah, I understand. Nobody, no one knew how to deal with it and they were doing whatever they thought was best. Mm -hmm. And um, it's just, I mean, you know, working in these facilities for as long as we have, we we know lots of people who passed on or, or okay. who were yeah. taken by COVID. So, I mean, it's, it's um, it, it happened uh, yeah. and it happened and it happened all over. Mm -hmm. yeah. Um, hopefully we won't have to go through that again so right exactly. hopefully we won't thank you you all set Brenda yes okay uh, Jennifer Heckendorf is next then Margaret and then Jennifer Green hi um, first of all I want to thank you for 
the work that you do and the large areas that you cover and the large caseloads that you have. I'm a former social worker that worked in a, a facility for, for years. Um, so I guess one of my questions is, how do you manage when, you know, there's such a, a lack or, or limited number of Medicaid beds and, and you know, beds in, in psychiatric units uh, for those, those residents? Um, and, you know, say someone has completed subacute rehab, they can't go home safely and they don't have the money to stay in a long-term care facility. And there's, the, you know, the limited number of um, Medicaid beds. How do you manage that? Well, well, usually, usually what we do is we, we come in and advocate for the person. Now, now, as Mary said earlier about, uh, about discharges, how uh, nursing homes um, will sometimes, when a person is finished with their uh, rehab, if that person can't pay private pay, then they want that person to go. Now, mm -hmm. if the person is not ready to go and the person is um, you know, what the person can't afford to pay private. Our first question when we come in is if you can afford to pay private, do you want it to go on Medicaid? If a person wants to go on Medicaid, then okay, we will help that person along with the nursing home to, to you know, get the Medicaid application and get that filled out. Now, if a home doesn't say, well, we don't have a Medicaid bed, which is what we hear a lot of the time. Mm -hmm. They still cannot force that person to leave because that person is currently in a bed. Mm -hmm. And it doesn't matter if it's a if it's a um, a Medicaid bed or not, you mm -hmm. cannot remove a person who needs, you know, who needs that level of care. Okay. Now you can you can that person can go to a different facility, but the a uh, nursing home still has an obligation to help that person with referrals mm -hmm. to go to a different facility. And that was kind of like the example that we presented about somebody not ready to go home and they just wanted to dump them. Mm -hmm. So, um, and and we do, we do see, and you know, there's, there's in Oakland County, there's two facilities that are just private pay for long-term care. Mm -hmm. And the unfortunate part is that residents want to go there for rehab, but they don't understand that they, that it's private pay from then on. So then they have to have a double move. So we try to educate beforehand if we do are able to talk to uh, residents that are gonna go into rehab facilities um, that, okay, it's private pay or in this facility, they have X amount of Medicaid beds for the long-term if you're going to stay there. So um, we try to do our best beforehand to be proactive, but we don't always get the calls. And, and 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 another thing too is that a lot of these uh, nursing homes, like these two that Mary are talking about, they mm -hmm. have hospital liaisons that bring people into the facility, and those liaisons need to be more proactive in explaining to mm -hmm. uh, to uh, anybody who they're going to take to their facility that you know once your Medicare days are over, mm -hmm. then it, this is strictly private pay over here. Mm -hmm. Okay, they need to be more proactive in telling people that, mm -hmm. but they're not because they mm -hmm. want those Medicare dollars. They do. Right. And, okay. and it just does a disservice to the resident really knowing does. that they're going to have to transfer again. And, mm -hmm. you know. Right. And I think just it's so important the education piece because so many people don't mm -hmm. understand that Medicare doesn't pay for long term care. They think, oh, I have Medicare, that's going to cover it. So I, I do agree. And, and I really appreciate. Um, all the work you do and 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 taking care of folks in the nursing home. So thank you so much. Thank, thank you. you. And another point to make about that is a lot of residents think that they're going to get the 100 days in that benefit period. I don't know anybody who thank has 100 you. days ever. <laughs> it's usually two weeks, three weeks, maybe four. 20 days that Medicare will pay. Will pay 100%. If, if you are able to participate in your mm -hmm. physical therapy. Correct. Oh, they yes. like to, they like oh. to cut. So it's really okay. about the insurance company. So right. right. It's a, the insurance company is actually dictating what you're getting and what you're not getting. A lot of people mm -hmm. think it's the facility and the therapy department, but that's mm -hmm. not necessarily the case. Right. And I, I think people too don't understand that you have to spend three nights in a hospital before you qualify for that. 
And right. some, and a lot of times the hospitals are keeping people in observation and they think mm -hmm. they've been there for three nights and they and go they into rehab and have to pay out of pocket. So yeah, exactly. I think just again, the, the education piece is really important. Mm -hmm. Yeah. Hmm. Interesting. <laughs> okay. Uh, Very Jennifer, interesting. Okay. I see Jennifer Green next in line, then Elizabeth and then Brenda. Hello. I was wondering, how does a nursing home resident know that they have an ombudsman? Who, where does, who gives them that information? Well, we are, our, the facility is mandated to post information about us. Um, but, you know, who's reading those posters as you go through the hall? So a lot of times other residents will let them know about us, other family members will. Mm -hmm. um, I mean, at the facility, the facilities do reach out to us or to help them with problem resolution. And let's say about the involuntary discharge about non-payment, um, they do reach out and we, we are not debt collectors. However, we don't wanna see the resident displaced. So we will try to meet with the facility and, and the family member if they're in charge of the residence funds to try to come up with a payment plan. So mm -hmm. they have to, the facilities have to do that. And they can't say you owe us 20,000 now, they can't do that. So um, so we do our best, like these community presentations um, and just being in the facility mm. as much as we are. So your contact information is posted somewhere in the facility, is that? Yes. Okay, mm -hmm. all right. Yeah. That's it, thank you. Sure. Okay, I see next in line, Elizabeth, and then after her, Brenda. Mm -hmm. I have a comment and two quick questions. First comment is, the issue of long-term care ombudsman office is close to my heart. My mother in uh, the early 70s helped found the first state uh, office of the ombudsman. Oh, wow. So it is wonderful That's that great. you folks are continuing. First of all, uh, is there a role for volunteers? There is. And so could you um, speak a little to it? Well, there is a role for volunteers, and um, now that COVID is more in control, I guess, um, our volunteers, uh, we're going to start recruiting, or we have been trying to recruit volunteers uh, more. So, um, but volunteers have to go through all the same training that we go through. So it's a process. Mm -hmm. But but yes, we we are we are open for for volunteers. It sounds like that might be something that we as a body might be able to get some information out to folks in yeah, the county that number, about that. Right. Then that my number, second question: that number, just, that number on the on the back sheet for the state ombudsman. If anybody wants to volunteer, that's a number you need to call. And you can always call me, mm -hmm. uh, you know, if, if if you guys are in Washington County, you can always call me and I can get your information to the state ombudsman. Then my next question is, uh, I'm a member of the State Advisory Council on Aging, and we've been hearing a lot about the fact that state funding for the ombudsman's office has been stagnant like forever. And Michigan actually has many fewer ombudsmen than other states of similar size. Um, do you feel that um, you could do a lot more if you had some more staff? We, we certainly could. And, and our agency is, is promoting is looking at grants and funding for uh, additional staff here. But you are right, Elizabeth, we have been flat funded for a long time. Mm -hmm. And so um, um, it, it's great to be at the agency here who is promoting our program to, to uh, for additional resources for uh, additional employees to cover. Because now, I mean, we're in the home for the aging adult foster care homes, but the new, the, coming up is that we have to be in there more. So that really um, ties up our, ties up the time that, you know, we spend the majority in the nursing homes. So, um, so there's now another level of, of homes that we have to 
a visit. So yes, we could always. And our and our numbers here in this in in uh, one in in one B are um we we uh the three of us the three ombudsmen here in one B cover about twelve thousand beds each. Yes. Wow. And each, there's no each. way. That, and and you asked if we could use help. There's no way that one person can cover that much uh, territory. Did you say 12,000 each? Yes. yes. Mm -hmm. That includes the nursing homes, home for the aging adult foster yes. care homes. Mm -hmm. So, um, so yes. And just uh. for the and just for the nursing homes, we're. I mean, even if if that was all we had to do was the nursing homes, we're still under we're still under under um help we don't have enough help even for for all the i mean you know we could use the help just to cover nursing homes but now they want us to cover um homes for the age and adult foster care homes that's that's just piling more work on us and and not enough people right we yeah. each we each cover about 35 homes nursing homes each exactly mm -hmm. And that's just your nursing homes, not your home for the aged or your adult foster care home. That's correct. Okay, Jennifer, are you all set or do you have more? All I'm set. done. All right, I see uh, Brenda next and after her, Phyllis. Okay, you guys have a wealth of information and thank you so much. We are planning a town <laughs> hall next June. <laughs> and I would like to know, if one of you or both of you would love to have both of you be available to share some of this information to the community. Sure, we could do that. Okay, and just like, um, uh, it's just I, a lot of things you're sharing with us today, I had no idea, no idea. Uh, and, I'd like to tell, uh, there's a lady in Washington County that uh, uh, says that, the ombudsman are the best kept secret mm -hmm. so um i tend to think we are because even though we're out there every day there's so many people that don't know about us oh, for sure. well you will be hearing from me later on with a date and time keep june available okay we'll be contacting you and we will make <laughs> sure that the public knows that you guys exist that's great okay thank, thank you, you. You all set, Brenda? Yeah, I'm set. Okay, Thanks. Phyllis? Um, the the uh, idea of volunteers helping, um, helping uh, this effort, which is so important. I'm wondering if um, volunteers, volunteer mediators could help settle some of these disputes. Uh, we have in Washtenaw County, which also serves Livingston, uh, the Dispute Resolution Center. <clears throat> and we there, I volunteer there, and there are many, many volunteers who could perhaps um, help settle disputes. Um, so, I don't know. Have you ever considered that? Um, well, you know I, cover I, mean? Livingston, I cover Livingston County and I have, I would, would love to, to meet these, these people. And, and you know what I mean? Um, so if you could take down my, my name and, and information and contact right. me, but those people would have to go through the training also, mm -hmm. um, you know, for the ombudsman. But you know what, if there's a group of, if there's a group of people that you think um, might be available, some of them might be available to do some of that, it would be great. Well, in, in Ann Arbor, well, it's located in Ann Arbor, but it's Washtenaw County mainly, but also Livingston. Um, it's called the Dispute Resolution Center and Belinda Doolin is the executive director I think she would be very happy to work with you. Okay. It's worth exploring. Let's put it that way. It's worth exploring. Yes, yes, yes. Okay, are you all set, Phyllis, or you have more? No, I'm all set. 
Does anybody else have any questions or comments or thoughts before we leave this presentation? Seeing none, I will thank the presenters. You've been very informative. Thank you. Appreciate your time. Yeah, thank, um, thank you for coming. And you'll probably be hearing from at least Brenda and probably more of us again. You will. Yeah. <laughs> so um, a point, we're at the point on the agenda now where we're going to take a five minute comfort break. So um, I, we will adjourn the meeting for five minutes and we will be back. Okay. Thank you.
Okay, I'm counting people here. Three, four, five, six. Okay, we have enough people to go ahead with the meeting. That's great. Um, so the next thing on the agenda is the county ARPA RFP process and fund allocation. Um, I don't know who wants to speak to that. I can speak to it and then, um, cause I have some questions I got from some other agencies for Commissioner Somerville and um, Ashley, if she's still in the audience. I don't think she is. I don't think she is. Uh, <clears throat> so we um, were successful in getting 3.8 million allocated to senior services throughout the county. Um, they held back 200,000 for the fund mapping request that we had a while ago um, to see where aging services are or are not being funded with county funds. Um, over 60% of the funds went to 48197 and 48198, which is great. Um, the questions that I've heard from community or the, the agencies is what can they expect Word. Um, some of them are feeling really nervous that they only have 13 months to expend these funds and they want to make sure that they can plan accordingly. I don't know, uh, Commissioner Somerville, if you can answer that or if we need to refer that to staff. I can try to answer it. Um, it's my understanding that funds have to be allocated but not spent down once we send them out. So I don't know. I can get clarification from staff. Thank you. Great. Anything else, Marie, on that? No, I don't have anything else. Um, Elizabeth, you were working on a proposed memo. Uh, I, I, we have some, the officers have some concern that the county commission doesn't actually completely understand what it is we're asking for in the fund mapping project. And so we thought it would be helpful to them if we were more clear about what we wanted and what we were asking about. So um, I, if you don't mind, um, Marta, can I? Oh yeah, you know what? I just skipped agenda items. I so much apologize. This, we're not even on fun mapping and I'm so sorry. We're, I'm, I'll am i put oh. that back out when we get to fun mapping. <laughs> okay, I was just gonna jump in and respond to that, but we can yeah. wait until. Yeah. I'm so sorry. I, I This is my entirely my bad. I skipped agenda items and I was almost done with the meeting. <laughs> mm -hmm. um, so uh, anyway, back to the RFP thing. Um, I don't think we have anything left over on that. Um, does anybody else have anything left over on that or are we all set? I'm looking forward to seeing what these agencies do with the funds that they receive. I'm sure they'll be doing good things. Okay, great. Um, so next is subcommittee um, updates. And the first one is communications. Is there a report from the communications subcommittee? Yes, um, we um, being led by Marie uh, were able to um, get a lot of communication about um, the proposed RFPs and work with um, the various agencies who'd submitted RFPs um, and with other advocates to, to support the RFPs. And as was spoken uh, earlier, uh, the uh, proposals and funding was approved. Um, it does, this process showed to us that we need to continue to work at encouraging individual members to develop a relationship with their commissioners. And the suggestion had been made uh, to come up with specific talking points on the issues. I am hoping that our uh, annual report uh, will, in essence, provide talking points for folks to share. So that's it. Okay. Anything else from communications? 
Okay, uh, ARPA. Do we have a report from the ARPA subcommittee? I didn't think we did. I know that Margaret had to leave for another appointment. So um, we'll ask them to um, bring forward a report at our next meeting. Um, potential millage, is there any report from that subcommittee? Yeah, so we've been meeting together as future planning and potential millage. Um, during our discussion specifically on the potential millage, um, it came up that if we, wondering how this group would feel about at our upcoming town halls or if we did additional town halls, having a feedback session from community members on the potential millage, what they might want that to look like, what their input is on that, um, and hearing directly from older adults on that. I see Brenda nodding her head, so I think she's writing that down as we speak. Mm -hmm. Maria, did I miss a meeting? Did we have a meeting last week? We did. I'm so sorry. I got confused. I apologize for missing oh, that meeting. It's okay. It's okay. Um, Phyllis, this was Phyllis's idea. So Brenda, for your town hall, get with get with Phyllis on on some of those details. Okay. Um, can I move into future planning? Yeah. Great. Um, during the future planning part of our discussion, we had an update from the Ann Arbor Area Community Foundation's Chris Lemon. Um, they said, he said that they were going to slightly extend the deadline of the work the consultants are doing because we, he's getting a lot of engagement. The consultants are getting a lot of engagement and we wanna really make sure that we're doing that process um, fully and um, specifically with some of the, the county allies, um, mm -hmm. it's important. So that's going along well in a little bit of an extended deadline. Okay, thank you. Mm -hmm. um, the last item of subcommittee is the town hall, uh, Brenda. Well, I made contact last week. I'm, I'm beginning to make contact with agencies and I did make contact with Michigan Medicine. Um, Nisha, N-E-Y-S-H-A, from Mich Michigan Medicine. She's the assistant director who would like to participate in the town hall next June. So that's what I'm working on. As you know, today I got two uh, agencies <laughs> who would like to participate. So that's what I'm working on. Thank you, Brenda. Um, anything else on subcommittee reports? Okay, now we're gonna talk about the report from the Board of Commissioners. Now that I'm back on the agenda and following the order, uh, the first item up is the county fund mapping project. And as I started to say before I realized I was confusing myself and everybody else, um, is that you know we feel that it might be helpful to the County Board of Commissioners to, uh, for us to be very clear and more clear than we have been in the past about the details of our request. So, I'm going to let Annie, um, Commissioner Somerville, respond, and then we have a proposed memo that we might want to send or consider sending to the Board of Commissioners. So, um, Commissioner Somerville? Yeah, thank you. Um, yeah, I welcome you all to do that and send a memo. Um, I will flag that there is an interest of the chair of the board to go in a different direction and collaborate with the Ann Arbor Area Community Foundation on this. Um, so just FYI, um, just so folks uh, know up front that you can send the memo. And I know that there have been past conversations about the county spending the 200,000 on that specifically, but that process hasn't started yet. The RFP hasn't gone out. And the chair mentioned at our meeting last week that there's an interest in not duplicating efforts and working um, with the Ann Arbor Area Community Foundation, which would free up those dollars. So just mm -hmm. FYI, that's something that is being talked about um, I haven't been part of those conversations. I was just informed during our meeting the other night. Um, as you all might have learned in the last few weeks, a lot of things happen um, behind the scenes that not all nine commissioners know about. Um, sometimes they happen during our meetings. So um, that's the update that I have on the mapping. Thank You're you. always welcome to send memos. Yeah, we will. Uh, you know, I think that 
uh, and the, the reason we decided to try to go in the direction of putting something in writing, if the entire Commission on Aging agrees, is that it seemed like the county was thinking that what we wanted was an index or some sort of um, um, directory of all the services for seniors in the entire Washtenaw County, and that is not what we're looking for. We are looking for how county funds are being spent specifically county funds. And if those are you know, divided by general fund and uh, flow through from other agencies, mm -hmm. that would be fine. But within Washtenaw County funding is what we're trying to clarify. Yeah. Okay, yeah, we probably don't need a consultant for that. I can try to get that information from our finance team yeah. because it's not a lot of money. Right. And there's like barely any GF dollars. A lot of it's passed through. So yeah. um, I am happy to, get that um it probably it, it might take a few weeks because the finance team's working on the budget but yeah that's that's a finance team question yeah. we don't need to hire an outside consultant yeah so we're uh, if it's okay with the commission commissioners um on the commission on aging we're going to put up a potential uh, note to send to the com board of commissioners um so taylor do you have that okay so um, Would you like me to speak to that, Marta? Yes, that would be very nice. Thank you, Elizabeth. Um, Commissioner Somerville, um, what you said is just exactly the direction that uh, the Commission on Aging has always had. And um, I think the, the Board of Commissioners we're looking at things a lot more broadly and clearly now working with the Ann Arbor Community Foundation, which has, since our first request, really initiated their assessment and uh, planning strategy. It sounds like it, the county board is in really good partnership working with the community foundation and giving them information in that broad way. So um, I think um, many people would be very uh, supportive. Of, we're very supportive of that. I'm sorry, I haven't had enough coffee this morning. But what was clear to, to us is we hadn't done our job in expressing clearly what we were asking for because the response uh, about a set aside and an RFP was much broader than what we were looking for. And Commissioner Somerville, you summarized it much more clearly than I think I did here, but we're interested in just knowing county only funds. How much is it? Um, and again, we know it's not that many dollars, but we almost get the question, how many dollars are it? And, I feel kind of silly that I can't answer that because we know that a lot of the programming is passed through or reappropriated state and federal funds from the Older Americans Act, the Older Michiganian Act, and other targeted monies, which the, the county spends a lot of time and effort administering, but it isn't general fund dollars. So this is what I wrote up. Please feel free if folks to jump in and make editing suggestions if this doesn't express um, our thoughts clearly. I, I just had one thought, Elizabeth, um, and that is I'm interested in knowing how much flow through money from the feds and the state are being spent on senior adults through the county. In other words, county programming within the governmental agency Washtenaw County. Do you, maybe you want to replace those last couple uh, sentences? Do you have some wording that I, I would find I would, better? I would strike the, I, I would, that sentence right there, I think, please note that we're not asking for information on the amount of all programming for older adults in Washtenaw County. Yes, programming is better. Thank you. And then to respond to what you said, um, maybe the last sentence should be, 
we want to be able to distinguish between amount of county only funds I think versus pass through and reappropriated yeah, funds. I would specifically say county general funds. Okay, thank you. Yep. County general fund. And pass through or reappropriated. Yes. Pass through or reappropriated federal and state funds. Yeah. And then stop yes. it at that. And that's kind of what they do broadly when we get our budget previews. Like when, if, if anybody watched our meeting, our working session this yeah. week. Um, and I, like a question that I asked, you know, we had this big chart of like what we spend on human services. And I was like, can we get something that breaks down how much we spend specifically on housing with general fund? Like those are the details that you can get into if you ask them more specific questions. So I will... This helps me. Um, so thank you for clarifying. Okay, so that last sentence, distinguish between county general funds and then the rest of it is okay. Uh, that I think more clearly capsulizes yes. what you want. Um, does anybody else have any editing suggestions? I see that uh, Phyllis has her hand up. Or is that an old hand? No, um, Dina does too. Um, yeah. So my my question is, it's not an editing question comment, but um, can you help me understand what? It, I think it's important to know what the county is already spending for senior services. Um. But what is that going to tell you in terms of the money that is needed to cover senior service needs? It is um, a different question, Phyllis. It, um, and it's an excellent question. And I think that's one of the things that the Ann Arbor Community Foundation's strategy planning process building on previous needs assessment will come up with what we wanted to get to and this came up in question as people began to discuss do we need additional dollars that potentially could be raised through a millage um we needed to know what is actually county general fund that the county controls and decides how that is going to be spent versus the bucket of pass-through monies that are federal and state monies where it's administered by the county, but the county does not really control how those are spent. Uh, the funding entity has made the determination that these dollars are for X and these dollars are for Y. So um, we just want this small part and it's just part of the puzzle. Okay, it's helpful. Thank you very much. Uh, Dina, did you have anything? Yeah, I have, I think it's a question. Uh, it's common in question. So if I, if I understand correctly, our um, what our intention is here, you know, we are wanting to know what are the uh, the funds that are specifically allocated for for programming for seniors. Yes. So one of the one of the things I keep I have heard from the commissioners is that there are there are funds that benefit seniors because they benefit all populations or they benefit all adults. So do we think that we have, you know, are we stating it clear enough? And maybe it's a question for Annie that we're, we're not asking about all the funding that goes to the county that may benefit seniors, but, you know, a very clear, like, this is the dollar amount and this is going to a program that is strictly for seniors. I see that. I think you should add that to the, I think you should add that. Uh, Taylor added a, a word there that said only older adults. Um, 
I think the sentence that says a simple way to obtain this information require their staff to submit, submit the amount of county funds spent on aging or older adults by their department or on services for older adults. Or in possibly maybe it's like on services, like uh, specifically strictly, for, strictly for. Strictly for, yeah, I like that. Is it appropriate for us to tell them how to obtain this information? I wonder if one, it's appropriate and two, takes away from the ask. Annie, what are your thoughts? I guess, could you clarify what you mean on how to? So this sentence says, a simple way to obtain this information is to da 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 da. Is that appropriate for us to include in clarifying our ask? I, I don't really know. I think it's okay. fine the way okay. that it is. Okay, great. Um, I had one more comment. Um, and this is related to the end sentence. So uh, we, I do think we want to be very careful and not, not, you know, make it seem like we're asking the county to tell us how much money that they get from like the Older Americans Act that then passes down, th you know, through like OCED. And, you know, one example would be to like Meals on Wheels. So um and I, I think you're trying to get it at that by saying distinguishing, but I, I do think we want to be clear that uh, the point of this ask is is not to just understand the federal the federal money that doesn't actually come from the county at all. They just distribute it. Right. I think we we want to know how much the county is spending. Out of county money. Mm -hmm. I think that the last, the, the second to the last and the last sentence should be, uh, you know, swapped around so that the. the oh, yes, I, that would make it much more clear. Yeah. And Marie, I know why you asked that question. So maybe we should say a simple way to obtain this information is to ask either the finance department or each county department head. Yes. Okay, now you've got to do a little wordsmithing there. Mm -hmm. Yeah, but you've, you've got, got to get rid of the each after ask and add a the before finance department. And then one thing is the, the last sentence, you need an extra M in programming. And I think I don't have any more revisions that I want to suggest. Does anybody else have any more revisions that we need to take up in order to get this right? Mm -hmm. All right. Sorry, I was muted. Um, what about in just kind of touching base on Marie's uh, concern, could we do a simple way to obtain this information? Could be, or some simple ways. Uh, could, could be. be. It's fine. Okay. Yeah, because we don't we don't want to make it sound like we're telling them how to do their jobs. So so put instead of is information could be. Yeah. Okay, any, any more editing before I call for a motion? One second. Okay, uh, who's gonna make this motion? So move. Okay, move Marie by second. Maria, supported by Marie, that we send this, um, I guess, mm -hmm. I guess we need to include, uh, that we send, that we send a memo to the county board of commissioners, uh, and then I guess the uh, the entire text of this has to be included in the motion. So I, can, I I I haven't found it yet exactly, but just a little comment that um, some 
some county funds may go directly to senior services and programs. Some seniors, plus some seniors will benefit from more general expenditures of to programs and services. Um, I, I think it's really difficult to sort that, but I think if you ask for just a, only for seniors designated um, services, then um, you're losing how like Meals on Wheels go also to um, people uh, with disabilities. And so I, I just hope that this includes that wording, um, which I, and I have to reread and, and it see should. if it's there. Just. It, may I respond, Marta? Yes, go ahead. Um, that is a very important point that um, seniors benefit from overall funding. An example would be some of the services provided for mental health services that some of the people may be older adults who access those, some aren't. That is not what that is a true point that does become very complex. And I do think that, and maybe the complexity of that might have been what inspired the original board recommendation to hire a consultant. However, this is a first start of information we don't have. And from the beginning of this commission, people have been asking, how much money is targeted just for seniors, not the mm -hmm. whole um, okay. element. And to your point about Meals on Wheels, it's true. People with disabilities are also served by that. But again, those are passed through reappropriated funds okay. on the whole. And secondly, we're never going to get super specific information. But I would like to be able to answer the question I get asked with some frequency, how many county general fund dollars are spent? Okay. Because the, the follow-up think questions will be, I suspect in the future, that there are all these needs, the That's county should is. spend more of its own money because the county doesn't control how much money on the federal or state level is given, but the county is in control of its general fund. Does that make sense? Yeah, thank you. Um, okay, um, uh, let's see, I see Annie and then Brenda. Yeah, I was just gonna say I have to go because I'm late for another meeting. Thank you for coming, we appreciate it. Uh, Brenda? Oh, I was just wanted to answer um, Phyllis's question, but you did a good job, Elizabeth. Um, what we're asking Phyllis is any money they spend, regardless of, if it's on Meals on Wheels or whatever, mm -hmm. is still the funding dollars that we're asking for. So we should get that, Phyllis, information. I think that there's two parts to this. There's also the, the data request for what proportion of Meals on Wheels services go to aging adults? That's a different request. Mm -hmm. should take up at another time, I think. Mm -hmm. Or how much money, you know, and well, anyway, we'll, 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 we'll go come back to that. The bottom line is how much money is the county spending on senior citizens in Washington County? That's simple. And the bottom <laughs> line, we can't make a recommendation on what we think about a potential future millage until we have this information. So, mm -hmm. yeah. okay. okay, so I think at this point, we've sort of, you know, beaten this uh, story about as much as we can. So 
I'm going to ask for a roll call vote um, to vote in favor of sending this to the county commission or against. So that's your choices for voting. So I'll ask uh, Taylor to call the roll. Juliet Ballard. Marta Larson. Yes. Marie Gress. Margaret Reynolds. Elizabeth Thompson. Yes. Jennifer Green. Yes. Phyllis Herzig. Yes. Jennifer Heckendorn. Yes. Jasmine Cooper had to leave. Brenda McKinney. Yes. And same thing with Annie Somerville. Juliet Ballard. Marie Gress. Margaret Reynolds. Okay, how many votes do we have here? We have quorum. How many votes Six. did we get? Six, okay. I will note that we are past our time, so some people had to leave because of other commitments, but we do have enough votes to pass this motion, so it will be declared passed. Um, I will talk to you, Taylor, about how we're going to submit this to the County Commission, um, this memo. Okay. Um, we still have two open seats, one in District 8 and one at large. I understand that Brenda has rounded up one potential applicant, so we're hoping to hear from that applicant soon. And I will follow up today with him. Anybody else that has any other ideas for people that might be interested in being on the County Commission on Aging, please continue to reach out. Um, let's see, a report from the chair. Elizabeth, you were gonna talk about the National Information and Referral Support Center webinar very briefly. Yeah, I've gotten information about a webinar uh, next Wednesday that um, deals with how we use terms about aging in our work and how we may reinforce negative stereotypes. Um, this is uh, the information about it. If maybe the simplest thing is if you could send this to our members, Taylor, and then if people are interested, they can register it. Mm -hmm. I can send it to Ashley to send it out to the listserv. That'd be wonderful. Yeah, so both to the Commission on Aging and the listserv, that's wonderful. Thank you for bringing that forward, Elizabeth. Um, I don't have any other report from the chair. Um, we don't have any new business. Our next meeting is November 3rd, and we're going to focus on um, a presentation on end-of-life planning, and we're also going to be looking at the first draft of our annual report. So we're gonna be very busy at the next meeting, that's for sure. So at this point, I will entertain a motion for adjournment. So move. Support. Supported by Elizabeth. And uh, the only, we don't have to do roll call, everybody just thumbs up or, you know. Say Bye -bye. And we are considered adjourned and I will see you all next month. Thank you so much for participating. Thank you.